Hola amigos, ¿qué tal? Stuart here from Spain Speaks with the Spain News Update. We'll have a look at some of the main stories that have caught my attention in the press here in Spain over the last couple of days or so. And we'll also take a look at some comments that have been left on videos recently. Before I begin, a big thanks to all of the people that have supported the channel in recent times, whether it's by buying me a coffee through the Super Thanks option on YouTube, my longer term supporters on Patreon, and a big thanks to new channel members as people that have joined this channel recently. Thank you very much for the support. Now, straight into the news and the masters of contradiction here in Spain, aka the Spanish government, are at it again. On Friday, it was reported that the Balearic Island of Menorca was going to be the home of NATO's third naval base in Spain. But on Saturday, the Defence Ministry denied that was the case. And as we can read here, the government rules out Maon as a NATO naval base. The government, through the Ministry of Defence has denied that the port of Maon, capital of the island of Menorca, will become NATO's third naval base in Spain after Rota Cadiz and Cartagena Murcia. There are no plans for the Balearic Islands to become a naval base for the organisation beyond its current role as an occasional port of call for the alliance's permanent fleets, the department headed by Margarita Robles announced on Saturday. On Friday, defence sources told Europa Press that Maon would be one of the bases is included in the Alliance's Sea Guardian operation, which aims to supervise and guarantee security in the Mediterranean, focusing on knowledge of the maritime environment to dissuade and fight terrorism, as well as mitigate other threats. For this operation, led by the Allied Maritime Command, MARCOM, based in the UK, the Ministry of Defence loaned the frigate Navarra, which left Rota on the 26th of March. So, there we go. On Friday, according to defence sources, the island of Menorca was going to become Spain's third naval base. But on Saturday, it wasn't. So again, contradicting information coming out of the Ministry of Defence. Now, keeping on the subject of NATO, and Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez has announced that he will be attending the NATO summit in Washington in July. As we can read here, Sanchez to attend NATO summit in Washington with Spain trailing in defence spending. The Spanish Prime Minister, Pedro Sanchez, will attend the NATO summit in Washington on the 9th to 11th of July this year with his homework half done. Although the defence budget experienced a sharp increase of 26% last year, Spain continues to be at the bottom of military spending among allied countries with 1.24% of GDP, only ahead of Belgium and Luxembourg. The refusal to approve this year's budget makes it very difficult, according to experts, to fulfil the commitment to reach 2% of GDP in military spending by 2029, which was made at the NATO summit in Madrid two years ago. So, Pedro Sánchez heading to the NATO summit in Washington in a few months' time, and he will do so knowing that his country still doesn't spend enough on defence. As we saw in that article, yes, defence spending in Spain is up, but it's still below the 2% of GDP required by NATO. So we'll see how Mr. Sanchez is received in Washington at that NATO summit by other NATO countries. Now, racism in Spanish football, again dominating headlines in Spain, unfortunately. And as we can read here, they called him a f He's devastated the racism in Spanish football that never stops. If less than a week ago, the Spanish Football Federation responded to the wave of racism in the stands of Spanish football with a friendly match between the national team and Brazil at the Santiago Bernabeu and with Vinicius Jr., the undisputed protagonist of the week, the awareness raising measures are proving insufficient in the face of new racist episodes experienced on national football pitches. Check Sa, Rayo Mahalaonda's black goalkeeper, suffered cries of as well as monkey sounds at Sestao's ground. Marcos Acuna suffered racist and xenophobic abuse at Getafe's home ground, where Seville coach Quique Sanchez Flores also had to listen to derogatory cries of Gypsy. So, there we go, and it seems that Spanish football, no matter how hard it tries, can't get rid of racism at stands at football grounds around the country. Players have been calling out this abuse now for a long, long time, and nothing seems to change. And it doesn't seem to matter if it's at top level Spanish football or lower level Spanish football. So time for Spanish football to wake up, get serious and get these imbeciles out of the stands. And the final story we'll look at today related to prostitution in Spain. 
and it is that 7 out of 10 Spaniards believe that abolishing prostitution would not put an end to it. On the 19th of March, the Socialist Parliamentary Group registered in the Congress of Deputies its bill to prohibit prostitution by means of an amendment to the Penal Code. This initiative was close to being approved a year ago, but it was thwarted in the lower house due to the early elections. Now its reactivation has brought prostitution back to the centre of public debate and doubts are resurfacing about the scope of the legislation and its capacity to prosecute this type of practice. In fact, faith in the government's plan is low. 7 out of 10 Spaniards, 71.1%, believe that the abolition of prostitution will not curb either the practice or consumption of prostitution in Spain. So a majority of Spaniards not optimistic when it comes to government plans to abolish prostitution here in Spain. And even if the government does get this amendment up to make prostitution illegal, the majority, as we saw, still thinks that it will exist. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Will Spain ever get rid of prostitution? Let me know. Now let's have a look at some comments that have been left on the channel recently. One here from the Seoul home. When I'm in Spain, I love going for a swim at the beach at around 8 a.m. It's so quiet and calm. A Spanish friend couldn't believe I did that and stated I was crazy. I nearly blew their head off when I told them I start work at 5am in Australia. But hey, that's why I love Spain. The evening lifestyle is actually my favourite. Yeah, the Soul Home, thanks for the comment and thanks for your input on this topic. And lots of people have given their opinions on this topic in recent times when it comes to timetables and schedules here in Spain. As we know, some politicians are trying to change Spain's late night culture, trying to make bars and restaurants shut early earlier. Some politicians are against this, of course, and I must say that the majority of comments that I have seen in the comment section on this topic, uh, the majority, I will say, are in favour of the current way that it is here in Spain. And the Soul Home, they're also saying that they prefer the way that things happen here in Spain rather than back home in Australia, where that person obviously comes from. So if viewers' opinions on this channel are anything to go by, it's going to be very, very difficult to change Spain's late night culture. One here from Michael, the majority of locals tend to socialise in the late afternoon to mid-evening and home before 10pm. Only British and Madrid tourists tend to be out partying to early a.m. Yeah, Michael, thanks for the comment, but I doubt it's only the British and people from Madrid that are partying into the wee hours of the morning. I think the majority of people in this country like to party late, or at least that's what I've seen in the 25 years that I have been living here. Doesn't matter where I have travelled to, whether it's the north of the country, the east of the country, the west of the country, the south of the country, the Spaniards tend to party late. But hey, let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Is it only the Brits and people from Madrid that like to party late, or is the whole country in on the act? Let me know. One here from Nigel. While I'm a frequent visitor to Spain and appreciate all that it is, I sincerely hope Spain is not overrun by tourists and loses the true Spanish character. That's what happened to the Caribbean, which is nothing but a cruise ship cesspool at this point. Yeah, Nigel, thanks for the comment, but unfortunately, some parts of Spain are already overrun by tourists. And that is why various groups are protesting in some of the main tourist hotspots here in Spain, for example, Barcelona, Malaga, or the Canary Islands, because they have already become overrun by tourism. But fortunately, there are still some places here in Spain that are not overrun by tourists yet. And you can still go off the beaten track and find a true Spain experience. But for how long? I've got no idea. One here from Stuart. Many Spanish workers don't work nine to five like in the UK. Okay. We have many family members in Spain working until 2 p.m., followed by a two hour break, and then returning to work at 4 p.m. until 8 p.m. This is one of the reasons that shops and restaurants stay open so late. Keep up the good work, Stuart. Yes, Stuart, thanks for the comment. And the thing that you mentioned there, that broken working day here in Spain where businesses shut down in the middle of the day between 2 and 4, or even sometimes 2 and 5, is something that a lot of workers do not like. And it's also one of the reasons why things happen later in this country, for example, having dinner. Because if you're finishing work at 8 p.m., what time realistically are you going to be sitting down for dinner? And what are you supposed to do during that two or three hour break that you have in the middle of the day? That's the question. 
So let us know if you're working here in Spain and you have this long break in the middle of your working day and whether you like it or not. I'd be interested to know. One here from Carol, Spain and its lifestyle is the attraction for me. I'm not a night owl, but to be able to eat and drink outside late into a balmy night is wonderful. I will spend money to come to Spain for this ambience. Perhaps the businesses should have a say. Yeah, Carol, thanks for the comment. And as I said a couple of minutes ago, you and many people in the comment section prefer Spain the way it is and don't want any changes, especially when it comes to the lifestyle and the late night culture. And let's be honest, that's the aspect of Spain that a lot of people fall in love with. Those long balmy nights, sitting outside, having a bite to eat and having a long drink. And I've got to admit that I've also enjoyed a gin and tonic or two or maybe even three at one of these Mediterranean beach bars on a hot summer's night. And uh, it was a fantastic experience. One here from Giles. France counts day trippers or booze crews from Dover to Calais, not really tourists. They only stay for a couple of hours. Yeah, Giles, thanks for the comment. And this could be one of the reasons why France has such high foreign tourist numbers. If they count that booze tourism, people traveling from Dover to Calais to buy a few cartons of wine. And if it is the case, maybe Spain should do the same thing and count all of the French that cross the border to buy cheap cigarettes and cheap booze. That would surely boost numbers. And the final one here from Safib, far right is what used to be right or even center right. Politics has moved way left. Yes, Afib, thanks for the comment, and you may be right. Far-right politics today is what we called right-wing politics only a few years ago. I know that the Vox political party, which is on the right side of right-wing politics here in Spain, is made up of people that used to belong to the Partido Popular. For example, its leader, Santiago Abascal, used to belong to the Partido Popular, but he decided that the Partido Popular politics weren't conservative enough for him, so he decided to set up his own own political party, as I said, to the right side of the right. And I know that that is also the case in Portugal with the Chega political party and its leader, who was also a member of the more traditional right-wing party in Portugal, but he decided that it was not conservative enough and decided to set up his own right-wing political party. And maybe the rise of these more extreme right-wing parties in both Spain and Portugal is the result of politics in both countries moving forward further to the left. Again, let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. On that note, I'm going to wrap this video up. Questions and comments, please leave them in the section below. If you have anything to add to the conversation today, the comment section is the place for you. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it, thumbs down if you didn't. I'll see you in the next one. Hasta luego.